the most influential leaders who through their nationalism movement and rebellion changed the course of Ireland's history. 1916, Easter Rising, background information. With the Acts of Union in the 1800s ratified in 1801, Ireland, which has been under some form of English control since the 12th century, merged with Great Britain to form the United Kingdom of Great Britain in Ireland. As a result, Ireland lost its parliament in Dublin and was governed by a united parliament from Westminster in London. The years leading up to the rebellion against British rule in Ireland in April 1916 were marked by significant political, cultural, and military developments in Ireland and throughout Europe. Home rule came to dominate domestic British politics in the era from 1885 to the start of World War I. Under home rule, Ireland would be, would be given more say in how it was governed while continuing to re remain part of the United Kingdom. The threat of home rule led Unionists in Ulster to establish the military organization, the Ulster Volunteer Force, which in turn prompted the formation of the Irish Volunteers. The emergence of these forces undermined British rule in Ireland. However, the possibility of violence in Ulster was averted by the outbreak of World War I. The main party in favor of home rule the Irish Parliamentary Party agreed that attempts to secure self-governance should be postponed for the duration of the war. So many Irishmen at the time joined the call to arms and fought in Western Europe. However, others were angered by what they regarded as the Irish Parliamentary Party's acquiescence to Westminster. Some moderate nationalists advocated for home rule. Which, you know, once again, that's how under which Ireland would remain part of the United Kingdom, but also have some form of self-government. Several home rule bills were defeated in Parliament in the late 1800s before one finally passed in 1914. However, implementation of home rule was suspended due to the outbreak of World War I. Meanwhile, Members of a secret revolutionary organization called the Irish Republican Brotherhood, the IRB, who believed home rule wouldn't go far enough and instead sought complete independence for Ireland, began planning what would become known as Easter Rising. They hoped their rebellion would be aided by military support from Germany, which was fighting the British in World War I. There's a person named Roger Casement who was born in 1864 and died in 1916 who was an Irish nationalist. He arranged for a shipment of German arms and ammunition for the rebels. However, shortly before the insur insurrection began, the British detected the ship and it was scuttled by its captain and Casement was charged with treason and executed in August of 1916. The name of the ship was called the Ard. That ship that carried 20,000 guns from Germany to, to arm the volunteers, which was intercepted off the coast of Kerry, and the arms were lost. This was a major setback. The Easter Rising was intended to take place across all of Ireland. However, various circumstances resulted in it being carried out primarily in Dublin. On April 24th of 1916, the rebel leaders and their followers, whose numbers reached some 1,600 people over the course of the insurrection, and many of whom were members of a nationalist organization called the Irish Volunteers, or a small radical militia group, the Irish Citizens Army, seized the city's general post office and other strategic locations early that afternoon from the steps of the post office. Patrick Piercy, 1870, he lived from 1879 to he was executed in 1916. He was one of the uprising's leaders. He read a proclamation declaring Ireland an independent republic and stating that a provisional government 
which would be compromised of IRB members, had been appointed. But despite the rebels' hopes, the public did not rise to support them. The British government soon declared martial law in Ireland, and in less than a week, the rebels were crushed by the government forces sent against them. Some 450 people were killed, and more than 2,000 others, many of them civilians, many innocent people, wounded in the violence, which also destroyed much of the Dublin city center. The rebels were outnumbered, bet somewhere between 8 to 10 to 1. They went in there, they were hoping for the best, but inside they were prepared to die for their independence. Now that we know a little bit of the background information, we're going to go into the, some of the, the vital characters and figures from that period who had a huge impact on the, the Easter Rising and who made the idea of Ireland's independence a reality. James Canali. He was born June 5th, 1868. He was an Irish Republican and socialist leader. Canali was born in the Colgate area of Edinburgh, Scotland, to Irish parents. He left school for working life at the age of 11. He also took a role in Scottish and American politics. He was a member of the Industrial Workers of the World and founder of the Irish, Irish Socialist Republican Party with James Larkin. He was centrally involved in the Dublin lockout of 1913, as a result of which the two men formed the Irish Citizen Army the ICA, that year. He opposed British rule in Ireland and was one of the leaders of the Easter Rising of 1916. Connolly was executed by a firing squad following the Rising. He was... So all the prisoners, which were the leaders of the Easter Rising, of the rebellion group, they were held in... The gay, gay, the G A O L, Gail, which is actually now called the Cannoli Room at the State Apartments in Dublin's Castle, which at the time had been converted to a first aid station for troop recover, troops recovering from the war. Cannoli was sentenced to death by firing squad for his part in the rising, and on May twelfth of nineteen sixteen. He was taken by military ambulance to Royal Hospital Kilmainham, across the road from Kilmainham, Gale, and from there taken to the Gale, where he was to be executed. While Cannoli was still in hospital in Dublin Castle, during a visit from his wife and daughter, he said, The socialists will not understand why I am here. They forget I am an Irishman. During the fighting of the Easter Rising, Cannoli had been so badly injured that a doctor had already said that he had no more than a day or two to live, but the execution order was still given. He was so badly injured, he was unable to stand before the firing squad, so they carried him out on a stretcher to the courtyard. His absolution and his last rites were administered by a capuchin, Father Aloysius Tra Travers asked to pray for the soldiers about to shoot him. He said, I will say a prayer for all men who do their duty according to their lights. Instead of him being marched to the same spot where the others had been executed at the far end of the execution yard, he was tied to a chair, then shot. His body, along with those of the other leaders, were put in mass graves without a coffin. The executions of the rebel leaders deeply angered the majority of the Irish population, most of whom had shown no support during the rebellion. But it was Cannoli's execution that caused the most controversy. Historians have pointed to the manner of execution of Cannoli and similar rebels 
along with their actions as being factors that called caused public awareness of their desires and goals and gathered support for the movements that they had died fighting for. Cannoli and the ICA, the Irish Citizen Army, made plans for an armed uprising during the war, which during the time was World War I, and independently of the Irish Volunteers. In early 1916, believing the Volunteers were dithering, he attempted to goad them into action by threatening to send the ICA against the British Empire alone, if necessary. This alarmed members of the Irish Republican Brotherhood, who had already infiltrated the Volunteers and had plans for an insurrection that very year. In order to talk Cannoli out of any such rash actions, the IRB leaders, including Tom Clark and Patrick Piercy, met with Cannoli to see if an agreement could be reached. During the meeting, the IRB and the ICA agreed to act together at Easter of that year. During the Easter Rising, beginning on the tw April 24, 1916, Cannoli was commandant of the Dublin Brigade. As the Dublin Brigade had the most substantial role in the Rising, he was defect commander-in-chief. Cannoli's leadership in the Easter Rising was considered formidable. Michael Collins said of Cannoli that he would have followed him through hell. Following the surrender after the Easter Rising, he looked at all the other prisoners and he said, Don't worry, those of us that signed the proclamation will be shot, but the rest of you will be set free. Another important person of that time was Patrick Piercy. In December 1913, Bummer Hobson swore Piercy into the secret Irish Republican Brotherhood, an organization dedicated to the overthrow of British rule in Ireland and its replacement with an Irish Republic. He was soon co-opted onto the IRB's Supreme Council by Tom Clarkey. Pierce was then one of many people who were members of both the IRB and the Volunteers. When he became the Volunteers' Director of Military Organization in 1914, he was the highest ranking volunteer in the IRB membership and instrumental in the later's com commandering of the remaining minority of the volunteers for the purpose of rebellion. By 1915, he was on the IRB's Supreme Council and its secret military council, the core group that began planning for a rising while war raged on the European Western Front. On August 1st, 1915, Pierce gave a graveside oration at the funeral of the Fenian Fien Jeremiah O'Donovan Rosa. He was the first Republican to be filmed giving an oration. It closed with the words, Our foes are strong and wise and weary, but strong and wise and weary as they are, they cannot undo the miracles of God, who ripens in the hearts of young men the seeds sown by the young men of a former generation, and the seeds sown by the younger by the young men of sixty five and sixty seven are coming to their guard against such processes. Life springs from death, and from the graves of patriot men and women spring living nations. The defenders of this realm have worked well in secret and in the open. They think that they have pacified Ireland. Pacified Ireland. They think that they have purchased half of us and intimidated the other half. They think that they have foreseen everything, think that they have provided against everything, but the fools, the fools, the fools, they have left us, our Fenian dead, and while Ireland holds these graves, Ireland unfree shall never be at peace. It was Pierce who, on behalf of the IRB, shortly before Easter in 1916, issued the orders to all volunteer to all volunteer units throughout the country for three days of maneuvers beginning on Easter Sunday, which was the signal for a general uprising. 
when Ian McNeil, the chief of staff of the volunteers, learned what was being planned without the promised arms from Germany. He countermanded the orders via newspaper, causing the RB to issue a last-minute order to go through with the plan the following day, greatly limiting the numbers who turned out for a rising. When the Easter Rising eventually began, on Easter Monday, April 24th, 1916, it was Pierce who read the proclamation of the Irish Republic from outside the General Post Office, the headquarters of the Rising. Pierce was the person most responsible for drafting the proclamation, and he was chosen as President of the Republic. After six days of fighting, heavy civilian casualties, and great destruction of property, Pierce issued the order to surrender. Pierce and 14 other leaders, including his brother Willie, were court-martialed and executed by firing squad. Thomas Clark, Thomas McDonough, and Pierce himself were the first of the rebels to be executed on the morning of May 3rd, 1916. Pierce was only 36 years old at the time of his death. Roger Casement, who had tried unsuccessfully to recruit an insurgent force among Irish-born prisoners of the war from the Irish Brigade in Germany, was hanged in London the following August. And if you remember from earlier, he was the one who tried to go to Germ Germany and make amends with them to have them help them. And that's when the Odd, which was the ship that had the 20,000 guns, got intercepted and they lost all those weapons. Sir John Maxwell, the general officer commanding the British forces in Ireland, sent a telegram to H. H. Asquith, then Prime Minister, advising him not to return the bodies of the Pierce brothers to their families, saying, Iris Sedimentary will turn these graves into martyrs, shrines to which annual pr processions will be made, which would cause constant irritation in this country, or county, country. Maxwell also suppressed a letter from Pierce to his mother, and two poems dated May 1st, 1916. He submitted copies of them also to Prime Minister Asquith, saying that some of the content was objectionable. Another vital leader during the time was Thomas Clark. Thomas James Clark was born March 11th, 1858. He was an Irish Republican and a leader of the Irish Republican Brotherhood from Dungannon County, Tyrone. Clark was arguably the person most responsible for the 1916 Easter Rising. A proponent of armed struggle against British rule in Ireland for most of his life, Clark spent 15 years in English prisons prior to his role in the Easter Rising and was executed by firing squad after he was defeated. Following Clark's falling out with Hobson, Mac. Dermot and Clark became almost inseparable. The two of them, as secretary and treasurer, respectfully de facto ran the RB, although it was still under the nominal head of the other men, James Deacon, and later Mick Caldwell. In 1915, Clarky and Mac Dermot established the military committee of the IRB to plan what later became the Easter Rising. The members were Pierce, Keenan, and Joseph Plunkett, with Clark and McDermott adding themselves shortly after. When the old fiend Jeremiah O'Donovan Rosa died in 1915, Clark used his funeral to mobilize the volunteers and heighten expectations of imminent action. When an agreement was reached with leading Marxist James Colony, and his Irish citizen army in January 1960, Cannoli was added to the committee with Thomas Mc McDowell added at the last minute in April. These seven men were the signatories of the Proclamation of the Republic, with Clark as the first signatory. It has been said that Clark indeed would have been the declared president and commander-in-chief, but he refused any military rank and such honors. These were given to Pierce, who was more well-known and respected on a national level. 
Kathleen Clark later claimed that her husband and not Pierce was first president of the Irish Republic. Clark was located at headquarters in the General Post Office during the events of Easter week. During the events of Easter week, where rebel forces were largely composed of Irish citizen army members under the command of Cannoli. Though he held no formal military rank, Clark was recognized by the garrison as one of the commanders and was active throughout the week. Late in the week, the GPO had to be evacuated due to fire. The leaders gathered in, the ha in a house in Moore Street from where Pierce ordered the surrender on the 29th of April. Clark wrote, on the wall of the house, we had to evacuate the GPO. The boys put up a grand fight, and that fight will save the soul of Ireland. He was arrested after the surrender. He and the other commanders were taken to the Rataware, where he was stripped of his clothing in front of all the other prisoners. He was later held in Kilmainham, Gao. He was court-martialed and executed by a firing squad on May 3rd, 1916. Before his execu execution, he asked his wife Kathleen to convey a message to the Irish people, my comrades and I, believe we have struck the first successful blow for freedom. And so sure as we are going out this morning, so sure will freedom come as a, dr a direct result of our action. In this belief, we die happy. The next person who not only made an impact during the rebellion, but also had an impact when he became president of Ireland, Edmund del Valera. In charge of rebel garrisons at Boland's Mills, Jacob's factories, and around Mount Street Bridge, del Valera saw little fighting. As the British avoided his headquarters at Boland's Bakery, he was among the last to surrender. A maths teacher and staunch Catholic, Dev was born in the U.S. to an Irish mother and escaped a death sentence after the Rising, partly due to his U.S. citizenship. The most dominating Irish leader of the 20th century, he was the president of the first Daly in 1919. And as Fianna Fáil's first leader, won five elections from 1932 to 1959, which bef after that he became Ireland's president from 1959 to 1973. Donna, born February 1st, 1878. At Claw Jordan, Co Tipperary, MacDonald attended Rockwell College and followed his parents into teaching. During a trip to the Aran Islands, he met Pierce, and the two became best friends. A poet like Pierce, he became the first teacher on the staff of St. Endos. With Joseph Plunkt, he edited the Irish Review and helped Edward Martin to found the Irish Theater in 1914. He joined the Irish Volunteers in November, November of 1913, and in 1915, the IRB. He was drafted onto the military council a few weeks before the rising. He was in command of the Jacobs Factory garrison on Bishop Street, now the National Archives, during the rising. Sean McDiarmada, also known as Sean McDermott, or John McDermott, was a leading Irish Republican who was involved with promoting the Irish language, the Gaelic reveal, Revival, and Irish nationalism. As one of the signat signatories of the Irish proclamation, he was widely respected and a talented po political organizer who believed that the only means of achieving the Irish Republic was by a revolution. So Sean MacDyer Dyer Mada, so Sean Mac Dira Madada and the Irish Republican movement. Sean joined the Gaelic League, a society that was formed in 1893 to revive the Irish culture. By 1906, he became a trusted member of the Irish Republican Brotherhood, IRB. After being sworn in by Dennis McColu, 
and would later be appointed to its Supreme Council. He set to work helping to organize Sinn Féin and other Republican clubs that were being set up by Dennis McCullough and Bomer Hobson to help spread Irish nationalism and Republican beliefs. With a talent for political organizing, he moved to Dublin in 1907 and became the national organizer for Sinn Féin. It was during this time he became a trusted friend with a well-respected figure in the Republican movement, Tom Clark, who helped the men with the revival of the IRB and be the first signatory to the Irish Proclamation. In 1910, Bomo Hobson started the publication of the Republican newspaper Irish Freedom, in which Sean Mac Diarmada would become the commercial manager. A year later, Mac Diarmada fell ill with polio, leaving him disabled on his left side, and although he was restricted to using a walking cane, he continued with his organization of the Republican movement. In response to the militarism of the Ulster protest, Mac Diarmada assisted with the funding of the Irish Volunteers in 1913 by recruiting members from other organizations, other organizations such as the Gaelic Athletic Association and the Gaelic the Gaelith, Gaelith League. By May 1915, Mac Diarmada and Clark formed a military council which also included Pierce, Joseph Plunkett, Emin Kinnett, and Thomas McDonough, with James Connolly joining them in January of 1916. The role of the council was to establish the planning and military action in the form of an uprising. The planning of the 1916 Rising. Both Sean McDermott and Tom Clark were well known for their secretive planning on the rebellion and kept the idea for most members of the IRB, including Eon McNeil, who was the chief of staff of the Irish Volunteers, and Eamon D. Valera, who was a member of the IRB and would later become president of Ireland. Both Mac Diarmada and Clark believed previous failed Irish rebellions were likely caused by spies and informants who infiltrated the ranks of Republicans so they were to ensure their own rebellion would not fail for the same reasons. The original plan was for the rising to occur on Easter Sunday of 1916, but a dispute with McNeil would have the rising take place on Easter Monday. Although McDiarmada had no military rank and was restricted to using a walking cane, he was present at the headquarters in the GPO as a member of the provisional government. After facing over 12,000 British troops and a high number of civilian casualties, MacDiamada and Pierce decide to avoid further deaths of civilians. They must surrender. Both men convince the volunteers that, that the, only the leaders of the rising would be the ones executed. Michael Collins, a soldier and politician who was prominent in the struggle for Irish independence in the early 20th century, he agreed to the partition partition of Ireland and the creation of the Irish Free State, becoming leader of its provisional government. Michael Collins was born on October 16, 1890, near Clonakilty in County Cork, the son of a farmer. After leaving school, he worked for the post office, spending nine years in London, where he became involved in radical Irish nationalist, nationalist politics. By 1908, he was a member of Sinn Féin, and a year later he joined the Clanstein Irish Republican Brotherhood. He then returned to Dublin in January 1916 and took part in the Easter Rising, but after its failure he was imprisoned. Although he was later rest released in December of that year, in 1918 the British government attempted to introduce conscription in Ireland and Collins went on the run to avoid the call law. He became the RRB's organizer-in-chief and assembled a network of spies within government institutions. In the 1918 December general election, Sinn Féin took 73 of 105 Irish seats, with Collins winning his seat 
for South Cork. In Dublin, January 1919, they declared themselves a sovereign parliament, Daly Ellerine, and then declared independence. Emin de Valera was elected president of the Dale, and Collins was appointed Minister of Home Affairs and later Minister of Finance. In this role, he organized the huge, hugely successful Dale loan, which financed the Republican government. Collins is most famous for his leadership of the Republican military campaign against Britain for the War of Independence through the Irish Republican Army. He directed a group of gunmen tasked with assassinating British agents whose campaign culminating on November 21st, 1920, with the killing of 14 British officers in Dublin. In the day of violence that followed, the British fortune British forces opened fire at a Gaelic football game, killing 12. When a truce was agreed with Britain in July 1921, Collins and de Villiers were the two most powerful men in Republican Ireland. Collins led the Irish delegation at the Peace Conference in London, which resulted in the Anglo-Irish Treaty of December 1921. This brought the Irish Free State into existence and partitioned the island, with six predominantly unionist counties in the north remaining outside the Free State, the treaty was passed by the cabinet in Dublin by one vote, with D. Villers opposed, and was appoint- accepted by the Dale by a very small majority. Collins became chairman and f- finance minister of the provisional government. Captain J. Bowen Colthurst. He was a British Army captain during the Rising. He was responsible for the murders of at least five innocent civilians, including Francis She Skeffington. His actions and the fact that he went unpunished helped turn Irish public opinion away from the British and towards the Nationalists. This really helped the Irish Nationalist movement. These leaders and organizers gave their lives for the belief of a free, independent Ireland. This rebellion did exactly what they thought it would do. It changed the public's opinion on British rule, and it led the way for Irish independence.